now I am introducing Joaquim Ortega, who will be the introducer of uh, Xavi Tolsa for this uh, last afternoon talk. It is uh, for me a, a, a pleasure and an honor to introduce uh, Xavier Tolsa. He's uh, one of uh, our more internationally recognized mathematicians in the, in the, in the Catalan community. And I'm, uh, well, I'm particularly proud that uh, all the institutions participated in his education. No? He has a, uh, he's a, uh, He's been, uh, he has a doctoral degree by the, in engineering by the Polytechnic University. He had his degree at the University of Barcelona and he had his doctoral degree in mathematics at the University Autonoma of uh, Barcelona. And his, uh, this, uh, this uh, doctoral studies was under the direction of Mar Melnikov, eh, who proposed him a very hard problem on the 60s, on the Vitushki problem, on the same activity of the, oh, of the analytic capacity, and uh, this is this was a, a very hard open problem that was essentially just given up by the community, and he managed to solve it, and this captured the attention no, of uh, uh, the, uh, the people in the Princeton Institute, and they gave him the Salem Prize because of uh, this resolution of this problem, and this was uh, followed uh, next year by the prize of the European Math Society for the solution of the Pinelebe problem. And uh, well, he's uh, been recognized to say he's been an invited speaker for the International Congress of Mathematics. He's been awarded two advanced grants and the uh, Jaume Premier Prize and well, many other prizes. I, I cannot uh, list uh, all of the honors and the distinctions, but uh, well, I wanted also to explain to you uh, what's his style of work? I mean, uh, how, how Xavier is. And I think he's, uh, for me, uh, he's essentially a problem solver. I mean, he works on, 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 on a very hard problem that exists already and uh, who's been tackled by many people. And, uh, well, he, he, he pushes it to the limit. In this sense, I'm always in awe of, uh, well, his self-confidence and uh, his hard work and the persistence that he manages to put in, in a problem. And uh, well, in, if you read his papers, they are the, 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 the mathematical style, and it's, they are not easy to read. I mean, I must confess, not for me at least. Eh? But uh, he, he shows uh, it's, it, they are always like a tour de force, and they are a very technical virtuosity there. I mean, it's, a, he, he, it's very delicate constructions that he pushes to the limit uh, and, and, and beyond. And, uh, on the, on the content of the mathematics that, uh, that he, he works, he, he's working in, in an area that, uh, well, well, most of his works deal with uh, two, two, two different fields. One thing which is the geometric measure theory, you know, so the properties of, of sets. And on the other hand, it's the analysis that you can do on these sets, you know, uh, whether you can get uh, bounded operators uh, on which measure supporters in these sets. And it's always the interaction in between these analysis uh, properties of the sets and the geometry properties that derive to them that, uh, that has, uh, well, that he has obtained many spectacular results combining these, uh, these two areas. And uh, the, the title of the talk that he, is going to present to us is a, is a well, so you say it's a conjecture of Carlson. That's one of these hard problems. And the reflectability and the square functions, so these are this geometric and, uh, and the analysis part. Of that. And it's uh, for me an honor to introduce it. Okay, well, thank you very much for this uh, very, very kind words. So, uh, uh, well, there is something that I am, that I agree is that I am stubborn and I try hard. <laughs> uh, of, and uh, yeah, you need some self-confidence, but you need a lot uh, to be uh, uh, very, very stubborn. And, to, and uh, of course, to uh, get results, you also have to fail many times. Well, uh, let's go on. So um, uh, I will, uh, well, 
this is a talk on pure maths, uh, though there are not applications, at least in this talk. Um, I have uh, tried to, uh, to, to I, I have chosen a topic that is not very technical, I think, so that I would say that can be understood by you. So don't uh, panic about what is a square function. Well, it's a function and there is some square there. So it's that, <laughs> only that. No, that, that's true. Nobody knows what's that. <laughs> it's a, yeah, this is, yeah. Well, some, uh, and yeah, it involves some kind of orthogonality there, behind. Well, let's go on. Uh, one moment here. Oh, oh. maybe I... Ah, yeah. oh. Bueno, uh, el que pasa es que está això aquí, que és una mica llet, però bueno, és igual. Ho deixem així? Ok, let's... Uh, let's move on. Oh, but... Uh... Ah, uh, yeah, with this, yeah, because there are many slides. Okay, I will start with some definitions. The first definition is the definition of length. What is length? Or uh, this is a, a length measure. Um, uh, well, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is this notion. So we start with an epsilon larger than zero, bigger than zero, and a set E in the Euclidean space. And then uh, first we define this H1 epsilon of E. Uh, this is the infimum over the sum of the diameters of the sets e i, a i, and these sets a i, uh, they should cover e, and their diameters are at most epsilon, right? And then we take the infimum. And then uh, what we do later is to take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, and this limit coincides with a supremum because, of course, uh, well, as epsilon goes to zero, this uh, quantity increases. Right? So this limit exists, could be infinite, but it, it exists. And this uh, is called uh, uh, R length of E, or in a more, more technical way, is called also one dimensional half of measure. This is the one dimensional half of measure of E. And uh, well, this, uh, this way of defining length coincides with other uh, usual notions of R length measure, for instance, on curves, right? The more typical definition, the most typical definition with taking segments. Well, that's, uh, uh, by the way, uh, one can also define uh, how those measures with other dimension, putting here, if in, when we, the, we could take the same definition and raise these diameters to some fixed power S. Let's say. And then we would uh, get a similar definition, and this would be the S-dimensional half of measure of B. So we can define many, many measures of different dimensions. And uh, well, and this uh, definition, this notion allows to, uh, to measure the length or to the half of measure of many sets. For instance, the planar one quarter cantor set. That is, it is constructed taking first a square of a side length one. Then we replace this by four squares of side length one quarter in the corners. Then uh, uh, here they, we have uh, squares in the corners of these squares of side length one over 16, then one over, so, uh, over uh, 64 and so on. So that uh, we have uh, at each generation n, so this would be generation zero, I would say. This is generation one, generation two, three. And then at each generation n, we have four to the n squares, q and i, of side length four to the minus n, right? Then, well, I, I will write something. So then we would have, we would define E as the intersection of the union of i equal one to four to the n of these squares. Well, you can think uh, that these squares are closed so that the intersection is not empty. And uh, then, well, it's uh, just a trivial observation that, of course, the sum, when we fix n, the sum of the diameters of these uh, squares is a square root of two, right? Because we have four to the n squares of, and this with the same length. And, uh, well, then we deduce this fact. And why? Because, well, just uh, go back one moment to the definition. Uh, we uh, consider in this definition the sets E A I to be just these squares Q and I. And then for each N, we consider 
discovering of E, this one here, right? This is cubes with these squares. And all right, and then uh, since we are taking an infimum, well, we, we have this, and it is immediate to uh, deduce this fact here. And with a bit more of work, one can check that, in fact, the Hausdorff measure of E uh, coincides with the square root of two. Well, uh, finding the precise identity is not very easy, but uh, showing that this is uh, some quantity, uh, non-zero quantity, is not difficult. All right. And uh, well, what, and one can uh, construct, uh, for instance, another triangular version that uh, so that uh, uh, I put here for fun. And then in each generation, we have here uh, three to the n triangles of side length three to the minus n. And then by the same argument, we have that this uh, set has a length that is positive and finite. Uh, okay, and that's all. And well, and now. Uh, we introduce an important notion in this talk is the notion of rectifiability. So uh, we said we say that a set E in the plane, we will be all the time in the plane, is rectifiable if it is almost everywhere. This means almost everywhere contained with respect to Hausdorff one-dimensional measure in a countable union of curves with finite length. Typically, curves with finite length are also called rectifiable. So, in fact, this uh, perhaps it would be more natural or more correct to call this set countably rectifiable. But anyway, this is uh, the usual uh, the usual terminology. Almost everywhere contained uh, uh, with respect to length means that it is that the whole set E is contained in this union of curves, except with the possible ex exception of a, a subset of zero length. All right, so this is uh, rectifiability. Of course, this is a notion that is stable by, by countable unions. On the other hand, a set is purely rectifiable if, uh, inter if it intersects any curve gamma of finite length at most in a set of zero length, right? So the intersection of it with any curve of uh, zero length, it has uh, zero measure, zero length. Well, well, well curve of finite length, sorry. So in a set, uh, in a sense, uh, E uh, pure and rectifiable means that all subsets of E, uh, E does not contain any subset that is rectifiable uh, except sets of zero length. Uh, there, uh, let me say that there are higher dimensional versions of this uh, notion of rectifiability. And then in set of curves, one uses Lipschitz images of affine spaces. So for instance, one could define end rectifiability in RD. And then uh, instead of a curve, we could uh, take the Lipschitz image of uh, an n dimensional. But uh, in this talk, uh, for us, it's enough to uh, consider uh, the case of one rectifiability in, and the one dimensional rectifiability in the plane. Well, an example of a pure rectifiable set, just this uh, planar one quarter Cantor set. Oops, there are two one quarters. And uh, the triangular version. So uh, if we uh, draw some curve or finite length here, uh, and we imagine that this is the set of infinite, well, of infinite, if the Cantor type, not this uh, finite generation, then uh, of course we can manage, uh, uh, we, we can uh, get that the intersection, that the, this curve may intersect the set, but the intersection will have zero length, assuming, assuming that the curve has finite length. Mm -hmm. Of course, we could take a piano curve that contains everything, but this, the piano curve will have infinite length. And the same, this triangular version is also uh, pure and rectifiable. And here for final, we also uh, put a, a photo that, uh, well, it's not, I'm not sure if it, possibly not a photo, it's a, a design from internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, because it's uh, all right. Uh, well, this could be a uh, uh, pure rate, uh, unrectifiable uh, set, two dimensional unrectifiable set in R3. Well, it, should, it would be of dimension two, assuming that the ratios that we have of this or the side length are chosen correctly. I'm not sure if this is the case, but we can, we, we can imagine something like this. All right. Then uh, what is the geometric measure theory? Well, I will not define this exactly. It's, 
it's like defining max, so what's that? Well, uh, but let's say that among many other things, geometric measure three theory studies the different characterizations or different properties of rectifiable and purely unrectifiable sets. Mm -hmm. This is the one of the uh, main uh, topics of uh, geometric measure theory. Uh, the, well, the father, uh, the, I think that the one that can be considered as the father of geometric measure theory is Vesikovic from the last century. He uh, developed uh, uh, geometric measure theory in the plane and he studied rectifiability for one dimensional sets in the plane. And in higher dimensions, the theory was extended by many people uh, like Federer, Mastran, Matila, Preis, and many others. Well, why are we interested in studying rectifiable sets? Well, rectifiable sets arise, uh, for instance, in singular sets for PDs. So that is, uh, 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 for instance, one uh, can consider a PD like, uh, uh, like uh, the Laplace or like a harmonic map in the end, and then typically singular sets or, more, or other elliptic PDs, singular sets, typically they are rectifiable. Also, minimizers in calculus of variations, very typically, also, they are rectifiable. Free boundaries uh, uh, are almost always yeah, rectifiable. Uh, also, rectifiability appears in many complex, in complex analysis and harmonic analysis. If, we, you, if you want to do a line integral, for instance, complex analysis, you can think that, well, you have to start with a curve, right? And then, but of course, there are uh, there are deeper pro or deeper uh, examples. All right. Uh, then uh, here, uh, uh, I will in this talk. Uh, I will, um, we, we, I will describe mainly the connection between rectifiability and tangents. This is one of the uh, yeah one of the main uh, points of this talk. Then uh, the first, so what we have to do next is to define a tangent. And then to define a tangent, we have to introduce the notation for a cone. So given a point X in the plane and a, vec a unit vector U and an angle theta like this, we consider this two-sided cone that you can read the definition. But if you are a bit, uh, a bit tired, it's better to look at the, at the drawing. We just have this point X here and then uh, this, we have this uh, vector, this should be the vector should be the con considered the axis of the cone. And the, the cone is this shaded region, and theta is the aperture of the cone, right? All right, then we say that a set e has a tangent e at x or in x. If there exists a unit vector u, it should be a, 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 uh, an axis of a cone, such that for all theta, there exists all theta between zero and p halves, p halves open, uh, uh, there exists some radius such that the intersection of V with this cone and with this ball is empty. Uh, and then the tangent, I will do a drawing now, the tangent uh, here is the line orthogonal to U. So the idea is that um, uh, well, we have, well, I will start with this. We have uh, this. The, we have this curve gamma. This, yeah, this the set e that could be just this curve, and then given this point x, uh, uh, this this cone here. This is an open cone. Does not intersect uh, the set e, and we can take this cone as. Uh, flat as we want, or, or this theta as close uh, to p halves as we want, and the price then to pay is to reduce uh, this radius here. So we are, we are saying is that this uh, the part of the set E inside the cone and inside this ball of radius R should be empty, right? And uh, if we take the radius small enough, then we will always manage this, all right. And then, uh, so this is the notion of tangent. This can be defined for any set. We don't need this set to have a finite length, for example. 
Uh, and now there is uh, the notion of approximate tangent that uh, also can be defined for arbitrary sets, but it is more natural to assume in this case that the, that the set E has finite length, finite uh, one-dimensional Hausdorff measure. So in this case, uh, well, we say that uh, E has an approximate tangent in X, if for all theta, we don't ask this intersection to be empty, but we ask the length of this intersection to be pretty small, or, or more precisely, we ask that this length divided by the radius tends to zero as the, as the radius goes to zero. So uh, the idea is that uh, maybe in general, we could, uh, uh, we, allow, uh, uh, we allow some uh, measure of the set uh, to be here, but if this measure is very small, then, uh, uh, well, this will be an approximate tangent. That is, the, of course, so the notion of approximate tangent is, is weaker than the one of tangent. Uh, then there is an important theorem that says that uh, if we have a set E in the plane with finite and positive, positive if and finite length, then a set, the set is rectifiable if and only if it has approximate tangents almost everywhere with respect to length, almost everywhere in, in, the, in, the, in the set E. And on the other hand, E is pure and rectifiable if and only if for all, for almost uh, all uh, point with respect to uh, length, there is no approximate tangent. So uh, uh, you see that rectifiability equivalent to approximate to existence of approximate tangent. Pure rectifiability, there are no tangents at almost all points. I would say that this frame is possibly due to Vesikovic. I'm not, I'm not sure. Anyway, I, I suppose he will not complain. All right. Uh, no, it's so much sure. All right. Uh, well, for example, it is. In, I think it's very uh, clear to see that this uh, set has no tangents at at no points because we can think that uh, there is no way to put a cone here if, uh, if, if this cone is close enough to to, to half plane, so that this cone uh, does not in, does not uh, contain a big part of the set at any, at any point. So it is uh, just a moment of thinking. Uh, you will realize that uh, this set has no, cannot have uh, uh, approximate tangents at any point, in fact. Uh, then another remark uh, here, I said that, uh, well, we assume uh, positive and finite length, but uh, as I said, the notion of, of the notion of tangent, not approximate tangent, uh, makes also sense for arbitrary sets. And it is, uh, it is not difficult to show that for an arbitrary set E, the set of tangent points is rectifiable. Uh, the set, uh, set of tangent points is the set where tang the set of the points where a tangent exists. Mm -hmm. All right. And now let we uh, go to another important notion. Uh, it's the notion of the beta number. Uh, this, this is a kind of, uh, uh, this is a coefficient that measures the flatness of a set inside some ball. So given a set E in R2 and a ball B, we define this coefficient beta sub E of B as this thing here that, well, it's uh, maybe it's a bit hard to read, but it's the infimum over all lines of this supremum. And here we take the supremum of, X in, of E intersected and E intersection with B. And here we put distance X, L, and here we divide by the radius of B. What we are doing here is uh, considering a ball B. We as, uh, consider, for instance, that this ball B intersects the set E. For instance, it, it, and the set E here is this uh, collection of this pair of arcs. And then what we are doing, taking this infimum, is uh, finding, we find the thinnest strip that contains the set E intersected with the ball. And the width of the thinnest strip is uh, twice this coefficient divided, multiplied by the radius, because the width, uh, we want this coefficient to be invariant by scale. So this is a coefficient that has no, uh, no, no, no dimension, right? Because it's a distance divided by a radius. So then, uh, uh, I repeat uh, that the width 
of this uh, strip. Uh, well, this is the double because uh, the here L is this half. And then the width of the strip is twice the beta, twice uh, or the double of beta times the radius. And this is the, for the optimal strip. So, but anyway, what you have to understand is that, uh, for example, uh, if E is contained in some line in the, in, in the ball B, uh, then this coefficient will be zero, right? So the flat, the flatter is uh, this uh, the, the, the set E, the smaller is the coefficient, and and, and conversely. And uh, then you can guess that perhaps this quantity could be re related to rectifiability, right? Uh, well, uh, for example, it is immediate to check that here, for any for any ball centered at any of the points of this set, this beta coefficient will be bounded away from zero, at least for radius smaller than the diameter of the set. It's, it is very easy to check this. Anyway, there is an important theorem by Bishop and Jones from 1994 that uh, says this, this, this thing here. If we have a Jordan curve in the plane, well, I remember that Jordan curve is an injective uh, uh, map of, uh, of uh, circumference, right? If I'm uh, continuous, <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, uh, then, uh, if we have a Jordan curve, then up to a set of zero length, then uh, the curve gamma has a tangent in x if and only if this integral is finite in x. And this integral involves these beta coefficients associated with the curve and the square. D, and we integrate the r over r and, uh, we, and between zero and one. That is, we could put here, this one uh, uh, can be replaced by any number, any finite number. What is important is that uh, this integral uh, arrives to zero. So, uh, okay, um, well, remember this uh, fact, right? So tangent uh, equivalent to the finiteness of this thing. And this thing, is a square function. This, for example, an example of a square function. An example, and well, it's an example. It's a function because it depends on x, and well, it has a square, so we can call it a square function, right? And this square reflects some kind of orthogonality. Later, you will, perhaps can, we can see something about this. And this function is called the Jones square function. And well, the study of functions such as this one and, uh, and other related functions or variants uh, allow, allows, uh, allows to use uh, techniques from harmonic analysis to study rectifiability. If uh, for people uh, that are a bit familiar with her harmonic analysis, uh, I, I guess that, uh, uh, or they should know that, uh, uh, <laughs> I hope <laughs> that, that uh, uh, harmonic analysis, for instance, has studies the, 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 the smoothness of functions, and then the smoothness of functions can be characterized uh, by, by the approximation of, of, of uh, that function in terms of uh, affine uh, functions or by uh, in a multi scale way. That is, this is the uh, so essentially, this is the so called uh, little with Bailey theory, right? And then uh, this, uh, so and then the Similar techniques uh, has, has, uh, uh, can be applied to the study of geometric measure theory. And the first one uh, who realized uh, this was uh, Peter Jones. And, and, this, and the, exam, the theorem that uh, uh, I showed you is an example of, of, of that result. Well, uh, then, the, as I said, uh, well, uh, uh, the study of functions such as this uh, allow to uh, study uh, rectifiability, but moreover in a quantitative way. So remember that rectifiability is stable. The way I defined or we find this is um, uh, so that it is stable by quantitative, uh, sorry, by countable unions. So that notion is not very quantitative, but it can be, uh, uh, one can define some, introduce some notion of quantitative rectifiability involving these uh, square functions, for example. And uh, some uh, uh, mathematicians that uh, started in this area were, uh, were Peter Jones, uh, Gidavid, and Stephen Sims. Also, uh, the use of 
uh, tools uh, uh, involving this uh, kind of functions uh, has been used to study the L2 boundedness of singular integral operators on rectifiable sets, for instance, in Lipschitz graphs. Uh, also, it uh, had a very uh, important uh, uh, role in the study of the Penelope problem for removable singularities. This is the uh, essentially uh, uh, if you. This is what uh, the, the, the related to what uh, uh, Joachim explained. Uh, 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 before in the introduction about the energy capacity. So uh, in that result, the use of functions such as this is uh, important. And here I had put a name on the name of some people that have participated, participated in this, David Matila, and some people from the Autonoma, from here, Melikov, Verdera, and myself. And well, and, uh, whoops. And, uh, well, and in, uh, yeah, and very recently, uh, 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 Neyber and Baltorta have realized, uh, well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's uh, three years ago or four years ago, realized that uh, one can uh, use uh, uh, these beta coefficients to study or to quantify the, uh, the size of the free boundary uh, in, in, in some free boundary problems and, and also to uh, for the singular set of minimal surfaces, connecting these functions to some monotonicity formulas. So it's, uh, uh, they are very nice results. All right, but uh, let's go back to uh, uh, rectifiability and to the beta coefficients. And to remember, remember that uh, the Bishop uh, John's theorem characterize existence of tangents in terms of the fineness of that square functions, square function involving betas. Well, the proof of the Bishop Jones theorem is based on the traveling Seisman theorem of Peter Jones. This is a previous theorem. What is the traveling Seisman problem? Well, possibly this, this could be one of these interdisciplinary problems, <laughs> but, but, this is, uh, uh, in this, but this is treated in here in, in, as in, from the point of view of analysis. So we have a collection of points in the plane, and then, uh, well, we find the uh, shortest path that connects all the points or the shortest curve that con contains all the points, right? So uh, this is known to be a difficult problem. Well, and uh, well, uh, and this was studied by Peter Jones. I will, uh, I will uh, uh, say more details in the next slide, but first let me say that, well, Peter Jones is this guy here. He's still active in mathematics and he has important contributions in harmonic analysis, complex analysis, and geometric measure theory, among other things. And in fact, I think that now in the last uh, years, he's, uh, uh, he uh, applied his uh, uh, ideas from rectifiability and beta coefficients to, to more applied fields. So these beta coefficients can be uh, apply to data analysis, it seems. So maybe this is an idea for some committee here. <laughs> All right. Uh, but it's not my field. <laughs> All right. So, uh, well, uh, this is the theorem of Peter Jones that I, uh, that I mentioned in the uh, preceding slide. We have a set in the plane. And then uh, uh, Jones uh, proved that the length of the shortest curve that contains E, uh, is comparable to this quantity here. So, of course, here uh, the set E is an arbitrary set. Of course, it can be an infinite union of points, non-countable points, right? And uh, well, a non-countable collection of points. All right. So, and then, uh, well, here uh, what we say is that the length of this curve is comparable to the diameter of V plus this sum. This is the sum of the beta coefficients of these cubes, 3Q square and here the side length of Q. Uh, before, here notice that I defined beta sub P of three Q. Uh, well, uh, let me, I will uh, uh, first, uh, I, we need some remarks and some about uh, some the terminology, some notation. Well, a, this, uh, I read this symbol as uh, uh, A comparable to B. A comparable to B, means that there exists a universal constant depending on most, for instance, on the dimension that here is where in the plane, so it's two. Uh, uh, universal constant such that uh, this, uh, we have this estimate here. As uh, well, you know that diameter of V is the, the, the nose diameter of V. 
And this D is the collection of all dyadic, uh, dyadic squares in the plane. So uh, uh, possibly most of you are familiar with dyadic squares because they are, uh, they are important tool, for instance, in measure theory. But if you don't remember, here you have uh, the definition. It's just, uh, they, let's say that for any K, for any K, uh, uh, we have a collection of cubes of generation K and they tile the plane and they are uh, disjoint and the side length is two to the K. And, uh, and uh, but notice here that these cubes uh, are all the cubes of all possible sizes. So of course they are, there is a lot of overlapping among them. They are, right? Although uh, not all of them will intersect here. But. Then 3Q is the square concentric with Q with triple side length. And L of Q is the side length of Q. And uh, well, I defined what is the beta coefficient of a ball. I didn't define what is the beta coefficient of a, of a cube, but well, you can guess that this will be the same essentially. It's just here you put a, instead of a ball, a cube. And instead of the radius of the ball, the side length of the cube. All right. So, uh, all right, so, um, well, this, is, this result is very important uh, and has been very influential in, in, in harmonic analysis and geometric measure theory in the last uh, decades. Uh, notice that, uh, I, for me at least, it's a bit surprising because uh, given an arbitrary set, you uh, quantify some coefficients at many scales and then uh, you can guess uh, what, uh, you can guess, uh, uh, the length of the minimal curve that will contain the set. Of course, if a set is pure and rectifiable, then this sum will be infinite, right? Because the length of the, there's no curve that contains the set. All right, no curve of final length. Well, and here I have the idea of the proof. It's just the idea, of course, the proof is a little, but the, the idea is, I think it's very, but the idea is very illustrative. Consider a, a, a very special case. A special case when E coincides with a curve, with a curve, a curve gamma. In, when, in the special case with a, when a set coincides with a curve gamma, well, we have that formula that the length of gamma is comparable to this, uh, to this sum where we is replaced by gamma, right? So, well, uh, then in the case when E is a gamma, e, when E is a curve gamma, here gamma is this, the black curve, uh, then we approximate this uh, curve in the first generation by this segment, this blue segment. In the second, uh, we want to approximate the length uh, or in some way, we want to approximate the, the curve by some segments. In the second generation, we approximate this curve by uh, this union of two segments and uh, so on, right? In the next generation, we have this uh, union of segments that approximates this curve. So now notice that we want to uh, see what, how the, length of this uh, union of segments increases and how converges uh, to the, to the uh, length, to the real length of the curve. So uh, consider this uh, segment here, for instance, and we call this length L, and then this uh, triangle I, is written, is uh, drawn here in red color, and this uh, is the, uh, the height of the triangle. And then the increment of length, that it is the difference of length between this uh, red part and this blue part is this thing here. It's just Pythagoras theorem, right? It's, uh, well, you can think about this um, triangle and uh, make a uh, figure like this, and, or anyway, it's a, a very computation shows this. And then this thing is, is, is very easy to check that is comparable to this thing here. But H divided by L is essentially the beta number of uh, this triangle, because the, the, uh, this triangle is contained in a strip that, uh, that uh, has uh, this size and, and it's here, right? So the beta number is H divided by, by L, or, or perhaps uh, by 12, there's a two somewhere, right? It's H divided by L. So this is beta square L. So then the coefficients beta, what they do, they measure the increment of length between consecutive approximations of E by means of curves gamma K made of segments of length comparable to two to the minus K. That's the idea. 
So that roughly speaking, we have that, uh, of, this would be gamma zero, now this would be gamma one, and this would be gamma two. So then H one of gamma K plus one minus H one gamma K is comparable to the sum of the coefficients, but here we only sum over dyadic cubes whose side length is two to the, two to the minus K. And then uh, when we do a sum over all K, we have a telescopic sum and uh, we have that uh, this one here, well, this will converge when we sum, will converge to H1 gamma minus the diameter, right? So that's the idea. So of course the proof is a bit more difficult, right? Because uh, this is, uh, we need to work with, of course that, that proof possibly works for the smooth curves, but uh, well, we need a proof that works for absolutely arbitrary, uh, arbitrary sets. And moreover, it's, uh, the, uh, it's uh, maybe one, uh, we have to prove two inequalities. So different, for, yeah, in the right, two directions of the frame, let's say. All right, but, but uh, this is the, the, the idea of the proof. All right. And now uh, the second part of this talk, uh, how much time do I have? Infinite? <laughs> well, well, anyway, well, well, maybe, well, I, 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 it's not much time. I think, I, well, all right. Don't worry, I will not, uh, <laughs> we will finish before eight. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, you can see here the number, so don't worry. All right, so uh, let gamma be a Jordan curve. Uh, when I talk about Jordan curve, you have to remember that uh, these Jordan curves need not have finite length. Now, especially in this in this result here, this is the the, strange, the interesting case. Curves, Jordan curves, which may have infinite length. And then uh, we consider the bounded and unbounded connected components of uh, the complement of gamma, right, by Jordan theory. And, uh, well, given a point X in the curve under some radius, uh, smaller than the diameter of gamma, for example, uh, we consider, or we denote by I, A, I plus XR and I minus XR, the longest arcs contained here in omega pi, uh, yeah, uh, contained in this circumference, but the part of this circumference that is contained in omega plus, and the part of this circumference that is contained in omega minus. And here there is some, there are some drawings so that you can follow better. So we have this Jordan curve, for instance, this could be some kind of a snowflake with infinite length. And here, this, uh, this is the circumference with center X and radius R, and this is I plus, right? With center X and radius R, and this is I minus. And here, but well, we may have uh, more than one arc, right? Then what we do is in this, in a case such as this one, we take the longest, the longest arc. Uh, here, there are two candidates, right? This one and this one. We take the longest one, is I plus, and the, the longest one for a uh, candidate for I minus is this one. All right. Then uh, theta plus minus are the angles corresponding to these uh, intervals or to these arcs, I plus minus, the, the, the angles, well, it's uh, uh, counted in, in radians. Uh, all right, so that for instance, if we have a curve or, that, or some curve that is or, uh, like this or, or some part of the curve that is a segment, of course, here, uh, these uh, angles are, uh, this, these are flat angles, right? So the, the, the angles are, are equal to pi to 180 degrees. And then epsilon XR measures the difference between these angles and pi so that uh, we take the, uh, the maximum of pi minus theta plus in, in modulus, and here uh, the, the, the maximum of pi minus, uh, sorry, and pi minus theta minus in modulus. So that, for example, of course, this coefficient here, since these angles are flat, uh, this will be zero. This will be zero here. Of course, here the, the epsilon xr is not zero. So, in a sense, you can guess that it seems that this coefficient possibly will measure, in some sense, the flatness also of some set, right? In the same way, 
uh, than beta coefficients do. And so we can introduce also this uh, other square function, which is a square function because it has an exponent, <laughs> correct exponent, right? And, uh, but notice that this coefficient, you, you should compare uh, this square function to the one of, of uh, Bishop and to the one of Jones. Uh, remember, notice that both coefficients, epsilon and beta, are, are coefficients that have no scaling, right? There's no dimension. They're, and uh, one should, and the idea is that, uh, uh, well, they are connected to rectifiability of flatness. And, uh, well, he, this, uh, here I, introduce, I recall the notation. And, uh, well, uh, then uh, what Carlson conjectured in around 1987 is that if we have a Jordan curve and omega plus and minus are the connected components, then up to set of zero measure, zero, zero length, up to set of zero length, then omega plus has a tangent in X if and only if this square function is finite. By the way, this square function is called Carlson's square function. So, uh, uh, well, first, uh, some remark. I, I define what is the tangent of a curve. Well, what is that? Uh, here I'm saying that some domain has a tangent. Uh, here, what we ask uh, when I say that a, a domain has a tangent, we ask uh, that gamma, that the, that the boundary has a tangent. And moreover, we ask something else. We ask that one of the components of this cone, remember that we have this cone, this component, this cone, this double cone should not intercept gamma, right? So now this is gamma. So now we ask that one component is contained here, for instance, in omega minus, and one component is contained in omega plus. And this should happen for all uh, radius uh, small enough. And for all theta between, given, z, given theta between zero and p halves, uh, smaller than p halves, uh, then uh, uh, this assignment here should hold for any radius small enough. All right. Um, uh, another remark is that uh, I told you that it is more interesting here to consider the case of uh, Jordan curve curves with, which have finite length because there is a theorem that, that says that if a curve has finite length, it is, then it is rectifiable. It is rectifiable uh, and then it has tangents by the theorem of Besicovic. So uh, let's say that uh, one of these directions in the case when gamma has finite length uh, is almost uh, trivial, is possibly this one, because in this case, the tangent will always will exist uh, independently of this condition at almost all points. Notice, by the way, that, uh, uh, by the way, that I say that the Jordan curve may have infinite length, in fact, non-sigma finite length, but this statement says that uh, yeah, it's a statement a modulo sets of zero length. So it's, so, uh, all right. Then the, con well, the conjecture was formulated by Carlesson, it seems, I say it seems because it's not written, well, it's, it's, it's he, I think that he didn't write explicitly this conjecture. Instead, uh, the conjecture was uh, uh, written in some, uh, papers by Bishop in the late 80s or beginning of 90s, and he attributed this conjecture to Carlson. Well, and, and uh, he formulated or they formulated this conjecture because uh, they found some uh, connections with harmonic measure. I will not define what is harmonic measure here, uh, but uh, well, let's see something easier. <laughs> well, this is uh, Leonard Carlson, right? He's a great analyst, uh, still alive. And uh, he has important contributions to harmonic analysis. He's very well known among other things because uh, he proved that uh, uh, if we have a function, a periodic function in, in L2 that is square integrable in between zero and two pi, for example, then uh, the Fourier series converge point-wise almost everywhere. It's uh, one of the landmarks, I would say, of harmonic analysis. Uh, well, he also has many other contributions to complex analysis, to complex dynamics, and, and because all of his results, he received the Abel Prize in, in 2006. Well, and this is uh, Chris Bishop. He's much younger. Uh, he's uh, still very active, and he has uh, contributions uh, 
uh, to complex analysis geometric measure function theory and very recently a very nice uh, results some very uh, important results in complex dynamics i would say and he was a former student of peter jones all right well recall this uh, we we uh, we were discussing about this conjecture right uh, Module a set of zero length, existence of tangent is equivalent to finiteness of this square function. Well, this implication, the fact that when gamma, when omega plus has a tangent, the fact that this square function must be finite uh, was or, uh, proved uh, in 1987, uh, uh, essentially by Bishop. Well, I would say essentially because uh, it uh, appears in Bishop's thesis, but then it's published in a paper by Bishop Carlison, Jones, and Garnett, well, in the correct order. Bishop, yeah, no, yeah, uh, uh, sorry. All right. Um, um, and, the, and the way they proved this, or he proved this, uh, is uh, by some estimates involving harmonic measure, using a distortion theorem for harmonic measure, uh, using uh, some estimate uh, found by Berlink uh, many years uh, before, many years ago. But, uh, well, uh, here I will not, uh, I will not uh, discuss about uh, this argument, but instead I will show you uh, an easier proof, well, easier, easier if you take for granted the theorem of Bishop and Jones. Right, that is uh, well. It's not so easy that theorem. That uh, remember that this theorem is based on the theorem of traveling Sherman theorem of of, of, of uh, Peter Jones. All right. Then it turns out that uh, these coefficients epsilon, uh, as I told you, they measure flatness in the same way as beta. And in fact, one can show that the epsilons are smaller than the betas times some absolute constant. At, well, at least if one has a tangent point and one assumes the radius is small enough. And the proof of, of this fact is quite easy. Well, notice that if we have this, then uh, remember that Bishop and Jones had shown that this equivalence is true if we put here the Jones square functions involving betas, right? So uh, if, uh, yeah, if omega has a tangent, then the square function involving betas will be finite. And so, since we have that the epsilon is more than the betas, also the square function involving the epsilons will be also finite, right? Well, and why is epsilon is more than beta? Well, it's just uh, uh, it's a remark, it's geometry. It's uh, just uh, 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 drawing a little. That is, for instance, consider uh, this piece of curve, this kind of snowflake, and take a point x here, and now, uh, this uh, ball centered in X and consider with this radius and consider the thinnest strip that contains this curve uh, inside the ball. And this is this strip here. Then you can guess that, uh, well, there is a connection between the flatness of this angle and the width of this strip. So just uh, yeah, some estimate using Pythagoras theorem and not, not much more. So it's an easy exercise for you, right? So uh, the epsilons and then this angle, the difference between this angle and, uh, and P and, and, and 180 degrees can be, can be estimated by this uh, beta coefficient, or if you want, in terms of this, uh, the width of this strip, and then using also this radius. All right. Well, and what about the other direction? Of course, if the other direction of the estimate uh, uh, the epsilon, if we had the, the betas were smaller than the epsilons, well, then we would be done, right? And then uh, I would not be talking about this here, right? Because, <laughs> because then this, that result would be a direct consequence of the throne of, of Bishop and Jones. Well, and of course, this is uh, absolutely false, and this is very, very easy to check. Just consider an, a domain such as this one, this one for example, consider a point x here, and then of course, uh, well, uh, notice that here, uh, well, uh, this, uh, the, the uh, angle corresponding to this arc and the angle corresponding to this arc is P, right? So the, the, these are flat angles. But of course, uh, the uh, beta coefficient of, of this part of the curve, beta of the curve, not the domain, is, is, is this thing here. So beta is not zero. So of course, uh, we are then 
uh, the epsilons are, are uh, in general smaller than the betas, but they can be zero. All right. Then, uh, uh, so the final slide. So uh, what, what happens about the other implication? Well, the, apps, the other implication then was open un until quite recently. And this uh, was proven by Ben Jay, myself, and, and Michele Villa uh, about two years ago. Well, well it, was, it was published one year ago, let's say, and, uh, and proved in 2019. Well, it turns out that, uh, well, the other implication is, is true, right? Uh, given a Jordan curve, except for a set of zero length, we have that the finiteness of this spur function involves existence of tangents. A few words uh, about the proof. Uh, well, one of the reasons why this is not easy to prove is because these epsilon coefficients are very unstable. For example, what means that they are unstable? For example, this means that uh, we don't have uh, an estimate such as this one. We, it would be helpful if we had uh, that this is true. But this is absolutely false. On the other hand, this, uh, well, beta gamma of x r, this is true. Uh, that this estimate is false is uh, trivial to check. Notice that uh, here epsilon is zero, as I told you, but if we take a, a, a ball, sorry, a, a, or a circumference also centered at x, and this circumference, for instance, uh, crosses this triangle, then the epsilon coefficient will be non zero, right? On the other hand, so the, this estimate fails. On the other hand, you can guess, or it's, it's, it's almost trivial to, to understand that if you, have, uh, if you have that inside some ball, some uh, set is contained in some strip, if we take half of the ball, this set contains to be <laughs> contained here in the same strip, right? Then just uh, this uh, number here will be two, right? Because of the difference of radius. And moreover, there is, it is very, it is, uh, yeah, there is, yeah, there, there could be jams and no continuities, and there is continuities with, when we change the radius and, and so on. Well, anyway, they are quite badly behaved. Uh, here, as I told you, uh, the interesting case is especially when the length is infinite. And some techniques involved in the proof, well, there are, uh, there are techniques of quantitative rectifiability originated from these words of Peter Jones and later refined by uh, David Sims and Leger. Of course, there are uh, newer techniques and newer arguments. And I would say that the newest uh, techniques are uh, some compactness arguments that are involved here. Of course, the use of compactness arguments is very uh, common in many, in geometric measure theory. But here, uh, well, there are some important difficulties uh, for instance, it turns out that uh, when one takes uh, sequences for Jordan domains, and uh, then they need uh, not converge in some uh, what is called the Hausdorff distance, uh, in in, it does not converge in, in uh, to another Jordan domain. It's not, they are not stable by, by blow ups or by anything like that. Uh, we also use uh, Fourier type estimates on Lich's graphs. And uh, well, and other things. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask if there are any higher dimensional analogs of the conjecture or yeah, like, uh, n rectifiable sets in a red plus one or yeah, it would be natural. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the difficulties is to find the right analog. In fact, uh, I uh, I am working a little with this with other people that are also interested, and uh, of course, uh, well. What is a Jordan curve? Now it's, uh, yeah. 
So this uh, should be different. And uh, moreover, in high, yeah, there's, but there are, uh, moreover, yeah, the, the coefficient should change. We should change a, a bit or, so of course, uh, one can think about many different generalizations, but it would be natural to find a generalization that is natural, right? Uh, for example, something that possibly or more sure will not is defining a coefficient involving uh, some uh, uh, L infinity type things. I, so like some length of this, uh, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then also another interesting uh, question is that something that uh, holds in for instance, when one could try to think, okay, let's consider just a, a homomorphic ball in a ren and uh, uh, characterize uh, uh, characterize tangent points. But uh, well, homomorphic balls, uh, well, they are uh, of course they are very they could be complicated objects. Moreover, here uh, these sets are lower content regular. It means that if you do if you do if sorry if you draw if you If you have uh, a curve here and you uh, consider a, a ball such as this one, then this uh, ball intersects the curve in a set that has a lot of uh, measure. That is, if you want, in fact, the Hausdorff content of this is comparable to the radius. It's or it's uh, the length, if you want, is this comparable to radius. But if you have, if you are in higher dimensions. Well, you can have like uh, spikes of this type with a very small area. And then the lower content regular, that is lower content regular, it, uh, that is in uh, the regularity fails. That is in, 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 in the plane we have this, but in higher dimensions, uh, in, R, in Rd, for instance, or in Rn plus one, Rn plus one, uh, in general, for, uh, uh, we would not have this. And this is uh, complicates a lot of things. So we are uh, fighting uh, with this. But yeah, it would be not. It would be uh, nice to find uh, something interesting, something uh, related. <laughs>